All right. Uh, welcome everybody to the Dodger Sinners Lecture Series in Philosophy and Neuroscience. I'm really thrilled today um, uh, to welcome Linda Dow, who is an Associate Professor at the Department of Anatomy and Neurosciences of Amsterdam University Medical Center. She did her PhD at the Department of Neurology of the uh, uh, VU University Medical Center and did her postdoc at um, Antinula Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging at uh, Harvard, Med Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. She currently leads the research section Multiscale Network Neuroscience, which aims to improve glioma patients' outcomes by understanding and manip manipulating uh, personalized multiscale network data. She is intrigued by network science as a translational methodology and uses it to explore the interdisciplinary crossroads between medicine, neuroscience, and philosophy. And she has recently written about the uh, ex exciting apex in the opinion paper, The Road Ahead in Clinical Network Neuroscience. Uh, for more detail, uh, the link to Linda's uh, uh, page with all the papers and all of her research uh, is in the, on our website, so please uh, uh, check it out. Uh, today, Linda will be talking about multi-scale network neuroscience. How can we link cells, networks, and symptoms in brain disease? So, Linda, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Daniel, for this um, opportunity to talk about at least one aspect of our work. Uh, and I've made the presentation a little bit so that I will go through a lot of data. Uh, a, a number of uh, papers and at the end um, the more philosophical discussion at least led by me comes but I can imagine that the more philosophically um, underlaid people in the audience will probably have many many philosophical thoughts along the way so um, uh, I'm happy with questions in between by the way if anyone uh, wants to ask a clarifying question or at the end it doesn't really matter to me um, so yeah, I'll be talking about how to link cells, networks, and symptoms in brain disease, and the reason uh, to do, or what sort of um, surrounds this whole problem is the tyranny of scale. So here, this is a, pro a, a figure from the Human Brain Project, which is a large project that aims to elucidate the workings of the, of the brain, and it's obvious that not only our behavior uh, um, uh, functions at different uh, scales, uh, or at least the, that the brain has impact across different scales, both in terms of structure and function. So on the left, you see spatial scales where uh, there are cells that impact how the brain is functioning from nanometers and proteins all the way up to the entire body and how we relate our body to the rest of the world. Uh, but also in terms of time, we can look at picoseconds, what, what happens in molecular dynamics all the way across uh, to development and uh, to de development and aging, where of course also a lot of change is happening, and I think a million dollar questions in neuros uh, question in neuroscience is how to deal with this tyranny of scales, uh, and I was quite interested to read this paper uh, by Bokulich in Synthesis so this or last year already, uh, which is not about the brain but about geosciences, but uh, it sort of hit home because. It's about uh, the mathematical modeling of a multi-scale uh, system, which in, in the paper really is about uh, geological uh, um, processes, but of course you can apply it, I think, also to the brain. Um, and what uh, the author says is that the tyranny of skills problem is the recognition that many phenomena of interest span a wide range of spatial and temporal scales where the dominant features and the physical processes op operating at any one scale are different from those operating at both smaller and larger scales. This physical fact then poses the following methodological problem. How does one go about modeling such a phenomenon of interest, especially when that phenomenon can be causally influenced by and in turn influence the entities at, and processes at the scales both above and below it? Um, and this is, I think, something that in neuroscience may not be, uh, I mean, this, this figure is very common to use and the idea that we have to link somehow all these different scales at which the brain um, um, is functioning or and structurally composed. 
um, but the bi-directionality um, across these different skills, I think, is, is not always explored. So um, I think a, a very common reductionistic way to think about the brain and skills in the brain, at least spatially, is that the basic scale, the most most the smaller scales are the fundamental scales. And then from the, the more uh, 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 smaller spatial scales like cells follow things like networks and ultimately behavior. And I think in our work, we try to see these different scales as more bidirectional, as signs of um, uh, things that can influence each other and that are therefore important to also take into account the, the way in which the different scales impact each other in both directions, going from small to big or from a short time scale to long time scale. And um, I'll be presenting some studies on what I think are not uh, necessarily ways to show that these skills impact each other, but that's what I would like to discuss with you at the end. Like, how can we move forward? How, do we have enough uh, reason to think that these skills may impact each other? And, and if so, what can we do to sort of hone in on that? So the population that I study uh, predominantly is glioma. Those are primary brain tumors. Uh, they are the most common type of primary brain tumors, but it's a rare disease to begin with. Uh, it occurs in uh, uh, six out of every 100,000 people. Um, it is a very fatal disease. Uh, most of the patients uh, do die from this disease at some point with a prognosis ranging between a mere 50 months to 20 or 30 years. And what's interesting about glioma is that uh, although the, the seizure as it's traditionally seen on a scan is very localized, and that's the way I drew it here in this nice schematic figure, um, it has a very clear whole brain um, impact. So for instance, patients suffer from mal seizures or tonic-clonic seizures that impact the entire brain. They also have cognitive dysfunction that typically cannot be ascribed just to one brain region, the region in which the the tumor is localized, but it, they are more distributed cognitive functions. Um, and um, the, the unique thing about these patients is that it allows for multi-skill research to begin with. So it's, it's kind of a, a window of opportunity in order to really get at these different scales at which the brain is functioning. Uh, because of course we can come from the level at which I uh, was trained and have been doing most of my work, which is, of behavior and uh, macroscale imaging. So you see an MRI scan, you see an MEG and magnesioencephalography to measure brain activity. We can ask patients to do a couple of uh, neuropsychological tests. And of course we can ask them to, to say how they feel in order to assess how many symptoms they have from their disease and what the most important symptoms are. Um, then like in all uh, neurological or psychiatric diseases, you can try to have a, 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 an animal model that captures the, the, the basic issues of this, uh, of this disease. And that can be done in glioma. Uh, we can do computational modeling based on cellular aspects. But what makes uh, glioma unique is that most patients, if not all, undergo a surgery, um, which allows us the opportunity to take tissue from the brain of the patient uh, and analyze it in the lab. Um, and then follow the, I mean, we can relate it, of course, to the situation at the surgery, but we can even follow the patient up after the surgery. And sometimes they get another surgery, which allows another window of opportunity to look into the brain at the micro scale as well. So that's kind of the methodology that we could leverage to, to look at this multi-scale problem. Um, and I want to start off by sort of telling you a little bit more about glioma and why I think um, it's so relevant for multi-scale research. But on the other hand, I think most other neurological uh, uh, problems have this sort of multi-scale um, uh, property. So if you are interested in another uh, disorder, I would be happy to go into it in this discussion. Um, but this is a figure already from 2015 from a paper that looked at glioma. So in what you see here in blue are gli glioma cells. So these are the actual tumor cells. And what wasn't known up until then is that these tumor cells are actually connected to each other through what is called microtubes. Um, and these are the sort of purple ligaments that are between cells. So the tumor actually forms a network of cells. Uh, and this network communicates. Uh, there are calcium waves that are traveling through this network. And it also means that there can be cells at a distance from the bulk of the tumor. So I 
already from the beginning want to sort of um, negate that idea that a tumor is actually a local problem because there are tumor cells across the brain. These things can be centimeters long. Another thing that is important to know at the, at the very micro level in, uh, in brain tumors is that there's a direct uh, link between brain activity and the way the tumor grows or the, the speed with which the tumor grows. And it's mediated by neuroligin 3. So I'll explain what this figure um, entails. So here you have a presynaptic neuron uh, that creates action potentials if it becomes act activated. This is just from a neuron that is around a brain tumor. Um, this is the postsynaptic cell. And then if this action potential is created, uh, we know that neuroligin 3 is sort of um, conveyed in the synaptic cleft. Uh, but what these authors um, uh, showed in 2015 is that if neuroligin 3 is in this uh, syn synaptic cleft, it actually activates a tumor pathway in the glioma cell. So the uh, mTOR pathway is an important um, way in which tumor cells um, propagate and invade um, and also uh, increase their cell division. Uh, which means that if there are more action potentials, then the tumor grows faster. And this cycle uh, was shown by uh, optogenetically manipulating brain activity. So basically, this is a causal way to, in a mouse uh, to increase neuronal activity, increase the number of spikes that the neurons around a brain tumor show, and then observe whether the, the tumor actually grew faster. And this proved to be the case. Now, Neuroligin 3, you don't have to exactly remember it, but I hope you recognize it later on because I will get back to it. Uh, but this is sort of a, a, a mediating effect, right? So you have a brain uh, a cell or neuron that's becoming active. There's an action potential that leads to Neuroligin being released. And then this pathway is being uh, activated, tumor grows faster. Uh, but then came the work uh, in 2019, which actually showed that there is an even more direct link between these two. Uh, so the neuronal network and the gliomal network. So what you see here are gli um, our neuro neurons, uh, which are connected, obviously, but also a glioma network in which these cells are connected through tumor microtubes. And if you then zoom in on this uh, process, you see in this neuroglyomal synapse uh, that every time an action potential is um, um, given by the presynapse, so the, the ending of the presynaptic neuron, um, then the tumor microtube actually gets uh, a calcium wave. So this is direct, although it's mediated by glutamate, but it's even more direct than this process by which neuroligin 3 activates the mTOR pathway. Um, so that means that healthy brain activity, if you consider it healthy around a brain tumor, but brain activity leads to greater um, calcium waves in this glioma uh, network, which then leads to proliferation. So the cells divide faster and invasion. So the cells, they move more and they take up more space. Um, and this is a glutamate driven uh, property. Now this is all relatively new, but I think you can imagine that this has had a great impact, at least on our view of the relationship between cancer of the brain at least, and neuroscience, because apparently um, there's this intricate relationship between the two. Beforehand, we thought more, there's a tumor, it impacts the rest of the brain, and we measure all these effects, and we uh, ourselves have looked at, at the distance effect, uh, distant effects as well. But this paper really showed that uh, there is also this bidirectional uh, inter interaction between cancer cells and healthy cells. So um, in one of our attempts to cross the different scales here is to look at whether cellular hyperactivity around gliomas is reflected at the micro scale. And the reason is a clinical one. Um, we typically cannot uh, look at cells around the tumor. I told you that there is, of course, resected tissue and we did make use of it in research, um, but it's much more difficult to obtain it. It's much more difficult to uh, analyze it. Um, and we really wanted to translate these findings in, in cells and in, in animals to the human situation in order to potentially use it clinically. So we asked whether cellular hyperactivity around gliomas is reflected at the micro scale. And this is a first um, sort of branch of our research in which we try to use particular measures that translate between scales. And um, this is a, an image of a normal power spectrum, which is what you see in neurophysiological measurements. So for instance, in EEG or MEG, 
uh, you measure brain waves, you measure, measure the oscillations that are um, uh, elicited by brain activity. Uh, and these signals are composed of different frequency bands. So there's all these different um, uh, sizes of or durations of the, of the oscillations in the brain. They're usually mixed into one signal. So you can find in one signal everything from 0 to 30. Um, and these have standard names. You might know the alpha band, which is the most commonly used uh, frequency band because it's the predominant one if someone is relaxing with their eyes, eyes closed. And you see also that when you uh, go into the um, uh, frequency domain, which is this plot, that you see the uh, extent to which each frequency band or each frequency is represented. So in this um, plot, you see here the different frequency bands. And here is the Fourier amplitude in arbitrary units. doesn't really matter. It's just the amount of that uh, signal or that frequency that is in a complete time series. And what you see here is the alpha peak that I just mentioned, that there is a lot of alpha in most people's uh, resting uh, recordings. Um, this is what we can measure very, uh, quite easily using, for instance, EEG, MEG. Um, and in order to really translate that to the micro scale, people have been doing very nice research where they use a combined measurement of both these types of signals with micro uh, uh, or single cell recordings. So this is someone who has been implanted with intracranial electrodes, which is a common um, method to really define where uh, epileptic seizures come from in patients with severe epilepsy um, that want to have a, a, a resection of the, of the epileptogenic zone. Um, and they are monitored for a week to 10 days with these intracranial um, or, uh, electrodes in place. And um, the innovation has been to add microelectrodes to this normal electrode array, which allows you to measure not only these, the kind of time series or the oscillations that I talked about that we measure at the micro, macro scale, but also the single cell spikes. So this is an example of what that looks like um, if you compare the two uh, across 15 seconds or something. This is the firing rate of the neurons that are in a particular, uh, around a particular uh, electrode. Um, and this is then the normalized power and how it changes within that window of time. Um, you see that sometimes cells fire a lot like here, sometimes there's not a lot of firing and you also see the power spectrum that's plotted a little bit differently here, a bit more swooshed together, uh, looks very different from here. Uh, and when you actually correlate these two, you see that firing rate of cells is actually quite nicely correlated to broadband power. And broadband power is the entire area of the curve of the power spectrum. So you would simply look at how much uh, power there is in this entire frequency spectrum. Uh, and that correlates pretty well with the firing rate. So we thought, okay, maybe we can use proper power as a measure of uh, spiking rate and see whether we see this same um, correlation between uh, neuronal, healthy neuronal activity and a glioma. So uh, postdoc Tiana Newman, she looked at this and what she did first is take patients with brain tumors, obviously with gliomas, uh, and she drew in the brain tumor, which is here in white, uh, and then she looked not only at the paratumoral brain activity, so she do, drew a number of paratumoral uh, virtual electrodes, as we call them, so measurements of the power spectrum around the tumor, but also replicated these um, locations in the other hemisphere from the hypothesis that if this mechanism that bidirectionally influ influences um, the tumor cells and the healthy cells that you would find higher brain activity around the tumor than in the contralateral hemisphere. So she looked at broadband power as a first measure um, for the reason I just mentioned. And I want to mention two other measures that are newer and that are still, I think, up to scrutiny a little bit more, but that we've been using a lot in recent times. Uh, one is the offset of the power spectrum. So that would be the sort of point where um, the power spectrum uh, crosses the, the y-axis and the slope. So that is an indication for how uh, steep or how non-steep or shallow the, the power spectrum um, coefficient is. Uh, 
Um, and I don't want to get into too much detail, but you might recognize a one over F um, uh, property in this power spectrum, which means that there's a lot more activity at the lower uh, frequency bands uh, than at the higher frequencies. And this has all sorts of physiological meaning as well. So we know that um, at the low frequencies, um, uh, that communication is uh, mostly inhibitory, whereas at the high frequencies, it's mostly excitatory. So this slope, the, the, the relative predominance of either low or high frequency uh, activity, tells us something about the EI balance of the underlying neuronal populations. Now, what we saw, uh, in, if we looked in these glioma patients, and we had two cohorts, uh, one big cohort, and then a validation cohort that was measured with a different MEG system, and we quite consistently saw that prop and power was higher in the regions that were surrounding the tumor than in the homologue contralateral areas. And they were also higher than in matched healthy controls. So all around, we could replicate this finding that there seems to be higher neuronal spiking around the, the brain tumor. We also saw higher offset and slope, by the way. Um, but then, of course, the question is here, do we then really see evidence of uh, that the mechanism that is happening within cells that was shown in animal research, does it really mean these findings that we can say that we're looking at the same thing? Um, so we also try to sort of link this macro scale hyper excitability that, that we see, can we link it back to relevant cellular properties? And this is work by PhD student uh, Yolanda Derks. She finished her PhD quite a while ago. Um, but she really pioneered this idea of, um, of looking at brain activity uh, as a marker of, of tumor growth. Um, and what she did was she took MEG from before a surgical intervention in these patients, but also took the tissue that was resected from the, in, during the surgery, the peritumoral uh, uh, tissue, and then looked at this important marker that I mentioned that you shouldn't remember, but I hope you recognize it, which is neuroligin 3, um, and looked at whether the, the, the uh, prop and power and the expression of neuroligin 3 went hand in hand. So what you see here on the bottom is low expression, a, a moderate expression, and high expression, and the broadband power is on the y-axis. And first I want to draw your attention to the difference between low and moderate, which is exactly what we would expect, right? Because higher neuroligin, uh, more neuroligin ex uh, excretion uh, is supposedly leading to greater broadband power in this feed forward loop in which the brain tumor grows and it, it, I didn't say that before, but it also excretes uh, neurally in the, the, the tumor growth pathway. Um, what, we, what was a bit strange, um, but we'll, we'll also come back later on, it, were these two, uh, three patients, which had actually very high neurally in three expression. You can see that here in an, in an example image, uh, but they didn't have that high of a problem power. And these were actually patients with oligodendroglioma and a 1P90Q code lesion, which is a subgroup of glioma patients. And actually in the papers that I showed you before about both the microtubes and also the neuroglioma synapses, these types of tumors rarely go hand in hand with extensive microtubes and uh, neuroglioma synapses have also not been observed in these types of patients. We really didn't know it back then in 2018. Um, but we think now that this is an explanation for why this uh, sort of association between broadband power and neuroligin 3 doesn't hold for this type of patient. So the next question in this study was also, can we then say something about growth of the tumor? Because ultimately, if there is high neuroligin 3 or moderate, in, as we call it in this case, if there is higher broadband power, does this have any uh, uh, relationship to the, the speed with which the tumor grows. So progression-free and overall survival are very important outcome measures in cancer in general, uh, and also in neuro-oncology. And we picked particularly progression-free survival since that is the time since diagnosis that it takes for the tumor to grow again, and to grow again in such a way that there's either a large um, um, increase of tumor volume on the scan, or that the patient has more um, complaints. And what uh, Yolanda found is that, yes, there is a relationship between these two. So um, with a hazard ratio of over two, 
she showed that people that have had high broadband power before surgical intervention, so the, before the start of any treatment, um, were also the ones that had the fastest progression-free survival. So a hazard ratio, for those of you not familiar with survival analysis, a hazard ratio of two means that uh, people with high broadband power had a twice as big risk or twice as short a time uh, until they developed this progression. So that would indicate that people that have this higher uh, brain activity are at risk for faster tumor growth or already have faster tumor growth. And interestingly, also for the scale, the multi-scale idea is that this was actually a global effect. So I showed before that around the tumor, there was uh, hyper excitability or th that the, the problem power was higher, um, higher than the contralateral homologue and higher than in, pay, uh, than in healthy controls. But in this study, we actually found that the hazard ratio, so the extent to which the value predicted progression-free survival, was very comparable between the paratumoral and even global drop in power. So we didn't need to take the exact uh, region around the tumor in order to be able to predict which patients would be um, uh, experiencing progression sooner. So that does beg the question, is that a local effect um, that has a, lo a large inter-individual variation, so to say? Um, or can we really look across the entire brain and, and is the the disturbance that we describe is it maybe already across the entire brain in this higher activity. Of course, you can't really study that in mice or in a petri dish. So um, the, the, the true microscale studies don't really answer that question. Um, maybe important for the clinicians uh, amongst us is the question, okay, you measured this before surgery, but then patients undergo this uh, tumor resection in most cases. So you take out part of the brain and of course, and, and mostly the tumor. Uh, and this of course impacts progression free and also overall survival because the extent to which the tumor is taken out uh, does impact um, how fast it will grow again. So we, uh, and we as Vera Belgers, another PhD candidate, um, replicated the, the study in a series of post-operative patients. So they first had the tumor resected, and then we looked whether there was still predictive power of the um, broadband brain activity um, for progression-free and overall survival. And there was with comparable uh, hazard ratios. So both progression-free survival and uh, overall survival were predicted by the, by, uh, the level of broadband power that patients had after the surgery. Um, okay, so that's, that's might suggest in taking all these results together that there's this um, uh, relationship between activity of the brain and then how fast a tumor grows in patients that already have a tumor uh, and in patients that already have um, um, pathological activity because we, we don't have any measurements from before they are first diagnosed and that's most of the data I've shown so far. Um, but the next question would be, if there is this relationship between brain activity and tumor outgrowth, outgrowth um, could it be that healthy or intrinsic brain activity at particular regions in the brain explains what we know about spatial variation in tumor occurrence? And just to go into that last part, we have known for a long time that uh, gliomas don't occur across the entire cortex. So or even the ent entire uh, white matter. There's a preference for glioma to occur in particular regions, and that's mostly the front to temporal region. So you see that here um, we study three different cohorts, one from Amsterdam, one from uh, uh, MGH, so in Boston, um, and this is the TCGA uh, cohort, which is the Cancer Genome Atlas. They have an imaging uh, part as well, so that's a publicly available database of scans of patients with glioma. Um, and you see that across cohorts, there was a predominance of these tumors in the frontal, uh, frontal temporal areas. And there have been a lot of um, thoughts on why this is. It could be that um, tumor stem cells come from the subventricular zones and they spread through the white matter. And that's why they are mostly around the ventricles and mostly in the frontal part. Um, but we thought, could there also be this link between healthy brain activity and the occurrence of tumors? especially in the gray matter, because of course, um, this explanation of the stem cells going through the white matter, they uh, doesn't explain why some tumors grow or tumors grow out in particular parts of the gray matter as well. 
So what uh, we did is we took a, this tumor occurrence map per cohort that I just showed you. Um, that's a group level um, um, map of which region has the most tumors in it. And then we used a healthy control data set to average brain activity at each, in each brain region spanning 210 locations across the cortex. And we looked whether those two would be related. So if particular regions of the brain that are nor normally in healthy people more uh, active would also show more tumors. So first, uh, I will show the results uh, for the IDH mutants of uh, 1P19Q code leader patients. These are the oligodendroglomas that I mentioned before. And we did not find a relationship. So if you remember, these are the patients that have less of these tumor microtubes and also don't probably have these neuroglioma synapses. So we weren't able to find any relationship for those patients that we also didn't find uh, the neuroligin 3 in. On the other hand, for the IDH mutants and the, and the wild types, so the, the ones that did show or that do have these tumor microtubes and the neuroglioma synapses, uh, we saw um, uh, quite strong relationships between brain act healthy brain activity and tumor occurrence. So what you see here on the y-axis is an indication of brain activity. So in this case, it's prop and power. Um, each dot is a brain region. Um, and then the y-axis or the x-axis is the percentage of patients with the tumor in that particular region. So what this means, and this is the one with, which doesn't have a significant result, so I'll go to the wild types. Um, which means that regions that have the highest number of tumors in them, so the highest propensity of the region to have a glioma, also have higher uh, brain activity. And that holds most strongly for offset, which again was the measure of neuronal spiking. It seems to be cleaner than the problem power, according to some. Um, and it also was the case uh, for slope. So EI balance, so the balance between excitation and inhibition of the underlying neuronal populations also seems to have something to do with it. So at the group level, um, I think we see that local brain activity of a healthy brain um, somehow uh, relates to the propensity of particular regions to develop tumors. Now, we also wanted to, uh, in addition to having this generalized um, uh, uh, correlation, which of course could be purely coincidence. We wanted to link it back to the clinical situation of the patients. So we next asked whether um, lens, and I will explain what it is, relate to tumor biology and performance status. So what we did here is we took the same average um, uh, brain activity per region from the healthy controls, and then we took the individual patient's tumor mask and overlaid these two to extract the sort of healthy or intrinsic brain activity at individual patients' tumor locations. So some patients would have a tumor in a region that is normally very active. They would have a high value. Some patients would have a tumor in a region that is normally not very active. They would have a low value. And then we related them to things that we already know about tumor biology. So this is the um, uh, tumor subtype, which I already mentioned. Um, there's different subtypes, it doesn't really matter, but the ideas mutant ones are the ones without tumor microtubes. They're also the ones that have the longest prognosis um, and they live for a very long time. Whereas the IDH wild type are glioblastomas and they typically have a very short survival. Um, and what we saw is that the, the lens, so the, the healthy brain activity and in particular in the slope, so the balance between excitation and inhibition or the slope of the power spectrum coefficient, um, tracked the, the molecular sub, uh, subtype of the, of, the, um, of the individual patients. So patients with a co-deleted tumor had a lower slope, then came the IDH mutant ones without, uh, without co-deletion, and then the, the uh, glioblastomas. So a higher um, excitation inhibition balance, which means, or actually it's a higher inhibition, uh, it's a higher, in, EI balance, if there's a higher slope, um, means that the, um, the, the tumor is, a, is of a, a worse subtype. And we saw the same when we looked at performance status of the individual patients. So KPS or Kinovsky performance scale is a, a, a very standardized, sh very short series of um, functional uh, statuses that we ask or that we observe in the patient, such as can the patient still walk? Can they take care of themselves? Um, can they, uh, or are they bedridden, for instance? 
And we saw that patients that had a low KPS also had high slope uh, at the tumor location or that the intrinsic slope at the tumor location was higher than the patients who had a high KPS. So we're still able to walk and take care of themselves. And this was in part regardless of the tumor subtype. So even in the IDH mutant co-leader tumors, which have a good prognosis, and as you can see here, have a low uh, lens slope, we also saw a difference between the patients within that group with low versus high KPS. Although you can obviously see that the, our statistical power is not really big because of the small numbers of patients we were able to include in this part of the study. So that kind of tells us that there's this um, um, bidirectional relationship between tumor cells, healthy cells that we can observe um, in the macro scale as well as the micro scale. The next question we wanted to ask and that I want to talk about here today is uh, we now only looked at measures of activity, which in, in, in typical um, sense, and at least as we use this is a very local uh, property, right? I, I did allude to the global nature of this predictive value of brain activity for survival. Uh, but I now want to get into the sort of um, uh, spectrum when you go from local to global. So we talked about local activity, and now I want to go to the more global perspective of the macro scale brain. Um, and for that, we use brain networks. So this is um, an image of uh, the seminal paper by Watson Strogatz on uh, networks in general, and also brain networks. Um, and network theory has been really a, a very cool tool, if you ask me, to combine both local uh, segregation or functional specialization or even anatomical um, local processes, and at the same time, look at the global properties. It really is a way to not only localize, but also distribute. Um, and these measures of clustering and path length, which are the most classical uh, network properties that we look at, they offer a way to sort of look across the scale from local to global uh, and see what is happening there. So for those of you not familiar with network theory, um, it's very simple. You have nodes, uh, which are balls in this figure, and you have connections between them. Uh, the clustering then asks how many of the neighbors of a particular node are also connected. Um, it sort of um, uh, reflects the cliqueiness of a network. Um, so how many subgroups are there that are very locally organized? Um, and another important measure is the path length, uh, and that's the number of ste steps it takes from one node to get to the other. And if you average them over the entire network, you see that there's this spectrum going from a regular to a random network in which a regular network is very clustered. You see all these triangles and little groups of nodes that are connected to each other, but the path length is also really high because it takes a long time to get from one side to the other because you have to cross all these intermediate uh, regions or nodes. The random network is the other way around. So there's almost no clustering if you draw a random network um, but there's also low path length because um, of all these long cross links and the optimum is where the brain is and basically any network uh, that sort of functions in the world um, where both are combined. So here you have both high clustering, there's local specialization, there's local segregation, um, and there is also integration across the different parts of the network. And the combination of the two, of course, is, is the most important one. Um, this is just an image to, for you to get a little bit more of a grasp if you don't do uh, or know network theory um, of what this means for the brain. So usually we have brain, uh, brain regions being the nodes in the network, and then we use some sort of measure of connectivity or connection uh, in order to, to draw such a network. So this is the structural network, for instance in which you can use diffusion weighted imaging to look at the actual uh, white matter pathways that are connecting different brain regions. And you can make a simple um, uh, depiction of the, of the different connections between the different brain regions. And you can look at the properties of individual nodes. So this is what I mean with, you can look at both the overall architecture sort of of this network, but you can also look at individual nodes and look what, uh, what their role is within the larger uh, network of the brain. And there's of course also functional networks, which is what um, we've been using more actually uh, than structural networks. 
And for that, you can use MEG as well, which is over here, uh, but also EEG and functional MRI, uh, because basically the idea is that regions of the brain that become active together and become deactivated together are somehow functionally linked. Um, maybe important to emphasize is that the idea is not that there's a direct anatomical connection or that there's a synaptic uh, um, link between these two brain regions, uh, but the idea is that like on the more coarse scale of the macroscopic brain at which we are at in this, with this type of imaging in our physiology, that they are functionally connected. And um, two important aspects that I want to highlight about the healthy functional network um, are modularity. So the idea that um, the brain uh, network, the functional brain network is organized into sub, uh, sub networks or subsystems. Um, I think this makes a lot of sense from uh, a neuroscientific perspective in general. We know that, for instance, the visual um, system is organized such that it's highly connected to itself, obviously, and less so to, to other uh, uh, subsystems of the brain. The same goes for the primary motor and sensory motor um, uh, areas. Um, but there are also these distributed networks, like the red one, which is the default mode network, which may ring some bells, and the frontal parietal network, which is in uh, yellow. Um, and these um, higher order association networks like the DMN and the FPN are thought to really integrate across the entire brain. So they are thought to bring this integration that we also see in the, in the, the very schematic networks that, are, that I showed before. So those are the whole brain sort of topological things we can look at, but there's also the individual brain region um, um, functionality that we see in functional networks. And I, I think that this paper by um, Bertolero et al, or Bertolero and Yeo, actually the two of them, um, does a really nice job at delineating two different types of um, uh, hubs in the brain. So hubs are obviously regions of the brain or of a network that are super connected and thereby very important for the entire uh, uh, network as a whole. And what you see is the difference between rich and diverse uh, hubs in the brain. So whereas the rich uh, hubs tend to be part of the default mode network, so there's this posterior cingulate region, the medial frontal lobes, um, some parts of the temporal and the, uh, the lateral parietal, um, these are regions that are always highly connected to each other. So they, are, they form this consistent core of brain activity that is constantly act, uh, uh, connected. And of course it's deactivated during a, uh, a task and highly active during rest. Um, whereas the diverse um, hubs are the ones in blue. They are more like the frontal parietal network. They switch. So they don't have a consistent high connectivity to the other regions in that module or even to other regions of the brain, they, they switch. Sometimes they connect very strongly. Sometimes they don't connect a lot. And they also switch in terms of how they spatially connect to different brain regions. So that means that they are um, um, less so than the DMN able to adapt their sort of connectivity to the, the needs of the environment or to the input that is generated throughout the entire brain. Um, so that's a little bit of a network neuroscience uh, step, step to the side tangent. Um, but the next question I want to ask in, in the relation to this, um, uh, this talk is whether um, gliomas are then accompanied by network alterations close by, because that's where we were with the activity part, and of course at the distance to make this switch to global as well. Um, this is actually the first study in brain tumor patients using network theory by Bartolome et al. Um, and they uh, found that whereas a healthy brain network looks a little bit like this, this is before we had source localization of the MEG, and it was a very simple depiction, uh, as you see here, you do see the two main things that I mentioned about networks. So there's local clusters, all these little triangles, but there's also long range connections that facilitate integration across the entire network. Uh, and what they now observed and which kind of led to this entire field in which we are um, is that in a patient like this, the network isn't locally disturbed. You see these uh, um, differences with a healthy network across the entire, uh, the entire brain. So it's not just the, the, the hemisphere where the tumor is, um, it just goes all over the place. 
And the most interesting part, I guess, back then was that although I show here a picture of high, high frequency uh, connectivity, which is lower in the patient, that there was this pathological increase. Um, so what we actually see if we take together all the literature, and this, this was done by Yolanda in 2014, uh, but studies since have sort of supported this main view, that whereas in the normal brain network, you have this balance between clustering and uh, path length or segregation and integration, that in brain tumor patients, you have a higher local clustering. So you see this um, increase in connectivity um, that is, um, uh, all well, I'll get to that, but it's on average all over the brain, uh, which is associated with higher seizure vulnerability. So like I mentioned before, uh, seizures do occur in almost all of these patients and it's um, the level to which the brain is organized in such a clustered way so the, the way in which activity but also dysfunctional or aberrant activity from a particular region can spread to its nearest neighbors and they are also connected to the nearest neighbors and that way it spreads across the entire brain that that link has been established quite strongly uh, but we also see that uh, there's a relationship between longer path length, so less integration and cognitive deficits. And we see this in brain tumor patients, but we actually also see this in a more normal range in healthy people, uh, that the more efficient the brain network is, so the, the more integrated, the, the better someone can perform on a cognitive task. Um, so the idea here was that this local increase in clustering or in in sort of noisy communication between brain regions that are relatively close by in the network sense, um, sort of causes the overall integration to go down because there's all this noise that is keeping the shortest path from being used. Um, but this was kind of the, the state of network neuroscience at some point that we knew about these global topological properties and didn't really know how this translated to local uh, properties. So what we then did, and this was uh, amongst others led by Shana Kulik and other PhD candidates, and we tried to see whether these network alterations are in fact truly global. And if all, at all do they relate to the intrinsic healthy networks? And I'll explain that a little bit more. Uh, but what uh, Shana and also Yolanda did is they took patients and healthy controls. Uh, they wanted to replicate, first of all, the globally high clustering that has been reported in literature and then compare peritumoral versus non-tumor clustering while normalizing for what we already know about spatial variation in, uh, in uh, um, clustering. Then see whether distance between the tumor and the local clustering was, um, uh, um, or whether distance was related to the uh, local clustering from the idea that maybe there's no difference between the tumor regions and the rest of the brain. Uh, but there could be some sort of gradient by which regions close to the tumor would show this higher clustering and regions further away would not. And uh, like I said, we related uh, this, did the same thing as Tiana did, which is map tumor occurrence to, in this case, local clustering of healthy people. So first of all, we were able to replicate this finding that local cluster of that uh, global clustering is altered. This should be global actually. Uh, is altered in these glioma patients. But what we see in this large cohort here for the first time is that it's actually a subset of patients. So this is the spread of the healthy controls. And here you see the patients and it's clear that some and even most of the patients fall completely within the, what you could normally expect in a healthy control um, uh, cohort. But these are the patients that are actually pathological. Um, so we zoomed in a little bit more on those patients and what we saw when we looked at either the tumor regions and the non-tumor regions that there's no difference between the two. So in the high, tumor, high global clustering group, so these are the ones in the, in the red uh, circle here, we saw that the tumor uh, and the non-tumor regions were just as abnormal in terms of local clustering, whereas the tumor and the non-tumor regions in the normal clustering group were just as normal in terms of local clustering. So that means that there, this indicates that there's at least no difference between tumor and non-tumor clustering um, in brain tumor patients. We then related it to Achillean distance, like I said, so these would be the regions directly adjacent to the tumor. These would be the regions uh, further away from the tumor. And as you can see, this is a, a 
cloud of points and there's really no uh, correlation. So this led to the, the conclusion, which is interesting that uh, local clustering is not just aberrant around the tumor and it doesn't differ from aberrant clustering far away from the tumor. And if you may remember the results that I showed you before, this is different for brain activity. Um, when we look at brain activity around the tumor, it's definitely higher than further away, even though the global properties of brain activity predict outcome in terms of uh, progression-free survival. But it's even more complicated, especially in terms of how do these scales then interact and Im impact each other, um, and particularly the scale of time in this, in this case, because we then again looked at healthy local clustering, so that's on the x-axis this time, um, that's of the healthy controls, what is the intrinsic clustering of a particular brain region, each dot is a brain region, and then this is the grouped or the, the summed uh, tumor occurrence. Um, and again, you see that higher clustering is associated with more occurrence of tumor. And actually, there's another paper by Mandal and colleagues um, in Brain, I think 2021 or 2020, that showed the same uh, principle for fMRI data, that brain tumors tend to occur in regions of the brain that are more connected, that are more, um, um, yeah, more connected in the, in the entire brain network. But the interesting part is, so this is a uh, healthy clustering. We didn't measure anything in the patients uh, and tumors tend to occur in regions that are marked by higher clustering and also higher activity as we saw before. But the interesting occurs when you then look at the actual measurement in the patients of the clustering. So again, we split up between high global clustering. So these are the patients that are in the red circle um, on the left that I showed before. These are the ones with normal clustering. And this is the healthy clustering of their tumor location. If you map the individual tumor location over the, um, the healthy brain activity. And what you see, and this is not significant, but it's borderline significant, um, that the high global clustering group has a tumor that is in a normally low clustering region of the brain. So even though tumors tend to occur in highly clustered regions, if they occur in a low clustering region, then the patient somehow has this high pathological clustering happening. And I think this sort of um, uh, hints or, or it gets at multiple questions uh, that we can ask, like, did these patients already have, can we really compare healthy low clustering with the patients? I mean, this was, um, um, uh, we don't know whether these patients already had higher clustering in particular brain regions. They could be different from the healthy uh, people we included in, on the left. Uh, but that would also be interesting, right? Because that means that patients who will develop at some point a brain tumor already have other clustering before they do uh, develop a brain tumor. It could also mean that the, the network as a whole um, responds differently to tumors occurring in particular brain regions with low clustering and perhaps low activity. Uh, then the network would respond to a, a brain tumor that occurs in a region with high clustering. And one thought um, uh, that we had or one hypothesis would be uh, that regions that have low clustering are typically, typically regions that may not be so... Um, may not have a lot of buffering space, so to say. So they may not be able to deal with any insult to the activity that is happening based on the tumor, which means that they could show higher aberrant uh, brain activity if, if the tumor occurs in that brain region. But of course, this is an, an interesting sort of multi-skill question that we could ask um, and try to get at in the future. I want to now Switch. This is the final sort of part um, in which I want to go even more into the multi-skill aspect of the brain and what it may mean for understanding of disease. And this last part, we use um, predominantly data from autopsies. So we have a, a very extensive um, research line within our department, within our hospital on post-mortem research, where we... Um, investigate the brain of patients who donate their brain to science. Um, and what we do basically, and this, this was in a project spearheaded by Svenja Kilian, also a PhD candidate who recently defended actually, uh, but we looked at network disturbances um, and the cellular sub substrates thereof in multiple sclerosis. I will talk a little bit more about what we expect um, 
in a moment. Uh, but basically, the whole idea of this, such a post-mortem research line would be that on the macro scale, patient dies, they, they are transported to the hospital, and then we do a post-mortem scan while the brain is still in the skull. So they go into the scanner and we can do, not of course functional imaging, uh, but we can do diffusion-based imaging. So that we can uh, make this um, uh, parcellation, these are the nodes, then do tractography, which is a way to extract which regions of the brain are structurally connected. We threshold them while well, these are a number of processing steps, but then basically we get this network in which uh, we can see which brain regions are structurally connected to which other regions. And we can look at particular uh, uh, network properties. So here um, is the clustering coefficient familiar to you. It's the extent to which regions of the brain are also connected, to, neighbors are also connected to each other. And fiber length, which is a structural um, version of integration. So longer fiber length means more long distance connections. And those are the ones that typically integrate across the entire network. And we did this for five regions of the brain and you see them here. So these are the five regions that we extracted from each of the patients and looked at the clustering and the fiber length. At the same time on the micro scale, uh, we, we extract the brain from the skull then uh, and we resect these same five regions. And there we can look at the properties at the actual micro scale. So uh, Svenja stain for neurons, for axons, for astrocytes and oligodendrocytes to so get an idea of the properties of the micro scale. Now, what's important to realize in general in MS is that we see very comparable network problems at that at that micro, micro scale level of networks. There seems to be a high overlap between brain tumor patients and MS, uh, and we saw that even in this uh, small study with only eight um, donors, because a greater lesion load correlated with both higher global clustering and reduced fiber length. So there was this increased segregation and there was a, a lower integration of the structural network according to how many lesions the patients had or the, the volume of the lesions. But of course, the interesting part was to be to cor correlate the two scales. So to look whether, for instance, neuronal size would relate to the clustering coefficient. Um, and I'm showing one of these correlations here, which we did with linear mixed modeling in which we took into account both the subject and the, the different regions per subject. And what we generally tend to find is that regions with larger neurons and higher axonal density have lower clustering and longer fibers. So that's what you see on the left. Uh, if a region is made up out of larger neurons that also have higher axonal density, so more axons, um, then the region would be characterized by a low clustering. So not that many local connections uh, but a long fiber length, so a more integrative um, uh, role of that brain region in the entire brain network. And the other, uh, these were correlations, so of course, vice versa for small neurons with low axonal density. These were mo mostly the locally highly clustered uh, brain regions. So that tells us something about how disease impacts uh, or the, the, the sort of signs of this disease across different scales. Um, but we can go a step further and, and talk about symptoms because ultimately, of course, that's where we want to also, um, we want to go from the cell to the symptom. And for that, we use the type of data that we also have for these glioma patients. And we did a study in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy uh, in which uh, surgery is achieved in most cases um, or, well, not of all patients, but in the cases we include here. Um, they also suffer from comparable network disturbances and there's a, I mean, the epilepsy network literature is huge. So I just picked some um, images from my own work, but um, it's definitely not the most, uh, the best um, uh, to illustrate the, there are better papers, but I, I had these figures and I think they convey what I want to convey, uh, which is that there's predominantly a, dis, a dis, disintegration of the default mode network. So that's what you see here. There's healthy controls. This is the functional network with fMRI. These are the temporal lobe epilepsy patients. And whereas in healthy controls, the default mode network, the red net network is one thing. It's, it has a frontal part and it has a posterior part. Uh, in temporal lobe epilepsy patients, the, the, it's basically disintegrated. So it's, it's being uh, cut up into two sort of separate networks. Um, and this is important because we know that DMN relates a lot to cognition. So for instance, memory problems. 
um, and particularly the different brain regions in the demon have been related to, and the integration or the, the network properties of different brain regions within the demon have been linked to, um, for instance, memory problems. And this is just to illustrate the posterior cingulate cortex, which is over here. Um, and we showed here that all these connections that we drew in white um, are different between patients with um, the same temporal lobe epilepsy patients, but just the difference between memory preserved, so intact memory functioning and disturbed patients. Um, another region that we very recently looked at um, is the lateral temporal lobe, which is, if you remember this image that I showed you of the DMN, is also part of the DMN, so it's in this sort of square here. Um, and we related uh, the, integra the um, uh, uh, integrative properties of this brain region to memory functioning using eigenvector centrality. And eigenvector centrality is basically another hub measure. So it takes into account how important a particular node is um, by looking not only at the number of connections it has, but also the number of connections of the nodes that it connects to. So in this case, none of the nodes that it's connected to have connections. So this is low centrality. Um, whereas this, in this case, the nodes that this uh, pink node connects to also have connections and more than the average. So this would be higher centrality. Um, and we found that this relationship, that there was a relationship between centrality of the, this part of the temporal lobe, part of the DMN, and memory functioning in these temporal lobe epilepsy patients. Now you might be wondering why, why look at all these different parts of the DMN. Well, in this case it was because this was part of a study that made really um, unique use of the tissue that was resected in these uh, patients um, and did a whole range of micro scale uh, tests as well. Uh, but also cognition, like I said, it correlated with uh, memory functioning. But basically what my collaborators at the FU did uh, was take out this, the tissue in the operating room, run to the lab, put it immediately in uh, a, a nice um, uh, medium and then uh, patch clamp uh, and do, um, do morphology analysis. So that's what we used in this recent study. Um, we, on the micro scale, took the resected node, which you can see here. Uh, we looked at total intrinsic length, length, which is a measure of how complex the neurons are in a particular brain region. Um, and we also did the patch clamp recordings and looked at the action potential kinetics. Uh, so that would be the speed of the action potential. And again, that says something about the complexity of, um, of the neurons and how much they are able to integrate. So the main idea was here to see whether integration at the micro scale, so at the level of average uh, neuron properties would relate to the macro scale. And at the macro scale, we use this measure of eigenvector centrality that I mentioned before, that was related to cognition in these same patients. Now, what we saw is that these integrative properties did indeed go hand in hand across scales. So this is a full sort of curlogram of the different types of centrality we looked at. So we looked for fMRI separately, we looked for MEG separately. We also integrated them using multilayer network technique. I won't go into the details, uh, but basically if you, so sort of squint your eyes, you see that all of these uh, correlations are green, which means positive. Uh, and some of them are um, large uh, or significant. Uh, and what that means, and I've sort of depicted that here below, is that if um, uh, regions of the brain, uh, or if patients have higher <clears throat> or faster action potential rise speeds, or a high, a greater total dendritic length, so that's more complexity, uh, then they also have higher uh, integrative properties or centrality of that region in the top of, uh, in the macro scale brain network. That's what you see basically here. So these two go hand in hand, at least between individuals. And we did some checking of this, of this um, analysis and it stayed um, relevant. Um, now to, to sort of think, to sort of close this off, the, uh, you might be wondering now, is this actually taming the tyranny of scales? What are we learning from this? Because I've presented mostly correlations between different scales. So let me just go into what I think based on, on these findings in terms of multi-scale. Um, and the first thing, of course, is what is the meaning of cross-scale correlations? You're just showing that there's one thing on one scale and there's another thing on another scale and they either correlate 
um, across space, which is what we do when we look within a subject and the, for instance, the MS study, um, and or they correlate between subjects. So that would be the, the final part uh, study that I showed you where uh, people with higher values on the one scale also had higher values on the other scale. Um, this does not mean this does not really get at this interaction that I mentioned in the beginning, which is the, the really interesting part I think about multi-scale research, that these scales impact each other. It may, may, mainly could mean, for instance, um, that there's principles of organization, right? It could be that something, some principle is making the micro scale look like one thing and the micro scale look like another thing and these two go hand in hand. It doesn't really mean that the scales impact each other um, at all. So that could be evolutionary or principle, but of course, since we only look in disease patients, it could also be that um, there are disease related shared causes that that sort of impact both of the scales that we measured in these studies, and that that's why we see that they are related to each other. But it says nothing really about the whether they impact each other. Um, so I think the next step, and we have some um, very preliminary. So I was, uh, they're, they're not ready to to be presented, but some very preliminary signs that multi-scale interventions may actually show uh, a more causal uh, relationship between scales. Um, and the difficulty here, of course, is that, uh, yes, if you, if you were able to very specifically um, uh, manipulate one of the scales and observe what happens in the rest of the scales, then you could hone in on the causal model scale processes. Of course, that's difficult to do in humans. And that's what we are interested in when we talk about uh, human neuroscience from cells to, to, um, uh, to symptoms. I think there's limited... Um, um, translation from really the more uh, animal model aspects of, of behavior that, that could lend themselves to, to really understand how multi-scale brain properties would relate to behavior. But I think this is where the real answers to the question, how do scales impact each other come from? Um, that's a fundamental question, like did we show now with these studies that there's uh, uh, relationship is, uh, or that there's that skills impact each other no I don't think so but I do think we show that this is relevant for clinical neuroscience uh, I think it's evident that the way at which brain disease um, manifests itself from the micro scale to the macro scale is something we need to really look at a little bit more um, especially since there are interventions that could sort of tweak particular skills more so than others um, and I want to draw particular attention to what we saw in terms of intra and inter-individual variation, which of course in general is a, is a big topic, I think, in clinical neuroscience, where you see that um, there's this normal variation that we see across the brain in terms of space. Um, and there's also, uh, and the, the impact of the disease has, or the, the disease impacts that to some extent. So that, that's what you saw in the studies in which we showed that there's um, larger or greater brain activity in, um, around the, the brain tumor in, in brain tumor patients, even if you correct for normal variation uh, across space. Um, but we also see that the, that the intra-individual variation across the entire brain is not very important when we try to predict progression-free survival, because there the global measure was just as good as the intra uh, individual um, or as the paratumoral um, activity. Um, so that begs the question whether to be relevant for clinical neuroscience, do we need to be so specific about exactly how these different skills interact? And that's something I think we can ask in general uh, when we talk about this type of research. And it's a discussion I've had with multiple people based on, for instance, the work where we show the neural ligand three to be related to uh, broadband activity and to survival. Is there enough reason to assume that we are actually translating these, these animal research findings to the human, or should we also do the same type of very uh, intervention, um, which you can't do basically. So, so then the answer would be, we don't know. Uh, or is there enough reason to think that we replicated or that we at least, um, honed in on that same type of mechanism that we saw in the animals. And is that enough for us to, to think that that is the case? 
Um, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Of course, I want to thank many, 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 many people. Um, so I won't go into the details. Um, but I really would invite anyone who didn't, who doesn't get to ask questions or has to leave to uh, contact me for any feedback. It's truly appreciated. Thanks a lot. Oh, there's no official end slide. I will just stop sharing. All right. Thank you, Linda, so much for this uh, really fascinating and really rich talk. I really, really enjoy this. Uh, so we are now open for questions and comments and discussions. And the best way to do it is just type uh, Q in the chat uh, or type in your question. And that way we have a chronological order of your inquiries. Uh, Linda's uh, email and contact details and other information is on the on the web page. I see uh, that Bert has his hand raised. Yeah, go ahead, Bert. Yeah, I have a. Um, I have the impression, uh, the impression that you have a very reductionist view on uh, on, on brain function. Really? Uh, yeah, cells cells communicate uh, in in a network, and that that leads to to function. Um, um, but there's there's also other other views, and I, I think I've mentioned that before, um, and that is uh, the concept of uh, John Joe McFadden. Who says there is an electromagnetic field that spans uh, the, the brain function, uh, the brain surface, uh, and that uh, and, and that's the mechanism that tunes the different parts <coughs> uh, of of the brain. So the apparent network is derived from that <coughs> from that mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, and you could say, uh, uh, according to that line of thinking, that a tumor cell uh, might disturb in a certain way, or a tumor uh, mass might, might disturb in a certain way this electromagnetic field. So <clears throat> uh, is that complementary to, to your way of thinking or uh, do you want to uh, completely deny that uh, possibility. No, thanks. It's a very interesting question, interesting topic. As you know, I'm fascinated by this. I actually don't think uh, that I think in a reductionistic way myself. Uh, I think what I presented today um, shows that that the, the the scales at which we investigate to begin with is based on a reductionistic history. And that's also why we picked these scales in some of the studies. Um, I'm, because I'm definitely not saying that the cell leads to the network at all. I think actually there's much more happening there. And I think the opposite is true, um, especially for functional networks, that the, the network dictates how the cell will behave. But I don't have data on that. But how how can how can you say that you uh, you clearly correlated what well, the size of a neuron yeah and the, and the axonal uh, co complexity yeah uh, to to its role in the network yeah but it's a correlation right so it's there's no direction in that I'm not saying that the the axonal properties lead to the the, the network properties. Nor am I saying in this research that the neuronal network is leading to axonal size differences, which I think can also happen. Um, but I'm, I'm just look, stating that these two go hand in hand. And that's also, I think, a major shortcoming of the, of the research so far is that uh, it is all correlative. So um, I think we haven't at all gotten to your actual point, which is, of course, that there are these causal mechanisms that may take place at, at multiple scales, right? Because yes, the electromagnetic field hypothesis, I think is very interesting. Um, if, that feel, if that field would be important and a tumor would disturb it, then yes, of course, it would impact the entire brain. It would still make me wonder why the peritumoral region more than others. Um, but I think there's also, so that would be an example where the entire 
like the, the, the large scale would impact the smaller scales. At the same time, that also happens locally, and we already know it. There's this whole theory uh, by Pascal Fries about how um, the sort of synchronized activity of larger neuronal ensembles impacts the way in which individual spiking is um, um, sort of taken up by the network or pro propagates, uh, which is, a say, well, it's very weird to say that these are similar ideas, but I think they are. I think they are both uh, examples where the macro scale would impact the micro scale. And, and I think that's super rare. And that's what I started with in the beginning, right? Saying that I think that this happens in both directions and that scales can impact each other in a non-reductionist way. It's just very difficult to show that it's the case. In network theory, we have this um, uh, idea, and I think it was Tononi who um, um, sort of posited it that the the dynamics of a the macro scale a micro scale ma macro so a large network would dictate the individual nodes activity and they proved this mathematically using um uh very difficult um <laughs> equations so i i'm not able to reproduce it but this idea i think comes back at multiple in multiple um ways and it's definitely something i hope we can look at in the future. There are, of course, studies where um, you um, change global or, or you give a very general large scale perturbation. I'm thinking about in the, the setting of brain disease you, and, and for instance, cognitive deficits, you could do a cognitive training, uh, which doesn't target neurons. It doesn't tar target particular brain regions. It's just something that you give to the entire human that is before you and then see what changes and and you can see that also the micro scale is then can then be altered um the difficulty is that you the causal interaction there is of course super difficult to investigate yeah i was thinking if uh, uh, if uh, live stage uh, or longitudinal studies would would help there are certain young children also with with brain tumors who do not have a fully developed network. Um, and you might get answers from looking at these, at these patients, how the, um, uh, how, how the presence of a tumor influences the, the construction of, of a network. Um, yeah. So, or, I mean, or the, whole, the whole global network, I would say. Yeah, how would how would that help us um, in the in relation to what you just said? Um, well, then the um, um, in in your studies, in your studies, uh, you have you have a uh, uh, at least that's my impression. Uh, you already have an established network in the brain, global network in the brain, and that's something. Uh, uh, interfering there mm -hmm. and you look at the consequences for the for, for the network itself um, yeah i i do think that because it uh, even in uh, in the womb in utero you can see the same network properties that you see in adults so this dmn the default network it's already active when while the the baby is still inside the the mother's uh, mm -hmm. womb uh, and of course, it changes across uh, development, um, but I'm not sure that those changes are bigger than, for instance, later in life. So glioma patients also can be older. And then there's, of course, this inverted U shape. So um, I think your point is super valid in the sense that we should always take into account the, the, the trajectory on which the brain is naturally because it's not like um, the brain network is established and it's static it's constantly changing and if you train it in a, in a particular way or um, you perturb it in any way then it changes so um, and also naturally changes according to uh, development or aging uh, but yeah that's an important point to consider as well it would be i guess it would in my view be even more difficult then to see which which skill is in, impacting which if, if everything is already changing. 
Yeah, it depends on the, of, the, uh, of the outcome, or, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's stop here. <laughs> thanks, uh, Beth. So, Harriet has a question. So, Harriet, uh, you want to ask it yourself? Uh, you're muted, Harriet. Um, thank you. Yes, I posted it in the chat, but uh, I will repeat it. Thanks, uh, Linda. Very fascinating. And... Uh, intricate also and i was wondering um regarding your the last part of your paper whether uh, given the complexity of the multi-scale networking models um or way of modeling um how to how to make how to how to go for causality and mm -hmm. uh, how to find it and i would suspect that an interventionistic account of scientific explanation would be most uh, promising in this respect but um, do you have any thoughts about what kind of interventions would then be uh, most relevant to develop? Yeah, yeah, I fully agree with you. Um, and uh, I think one interesting um, intervention would be TMS, so transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, because that basically what it does is it offers uh, magnetic stimulation of one particular part of the brain. It has a resolution of a centimeter, uh, uh, near near a centimeter. Um, so you're impacting um, one scale, the mesoscale of the brain, basically. Um, but we already know that it has impact on uh, both other, like the other scales around it. So it also impacts the micro scale in, in terms of how... Um, um, neurotransmitter uh, um, densities are changing and it also impacts connectivity obviously because if you increase the activity of one brain region then it might propagate to the rest of uh, or to other regions at least um, and that is one that is of course also used therapeutically especially in psychiatric disease where for depression it's been uh, most used I think to change not just local excitability of the target region, but also um, the entire network that it's connected to. Um, the difficulty, of course, is there that you don't know what is happening on the, on the real micro scale and how that sort of unfolds. So I think TMS would be a nice way to look at the local versus global effects, for sure. Um, and that has already been sort of looked at a little bit but it doesn't take the, the, the true micro scale into account. Another potential um, um, intervention I see that is a little bit more difficult, but might be interesting is um, more systemic impact, uh, treatments um, where you target very specific molecules or micro scale properties. So for instance, we, in other research, we've, seen, we've shown that um, levetiracetam, which is an anti-epileptic drug that most of these brain tumor patients use and also regular epilepsy patients, um, we know that it binds to SVTA 2A, so that's synaptic vesicle protein 2A, um, which directly impacts synaptic functioning. Um, it works really well in these patients, uh, has very little, little um, negative side effects in most patients. Um, it tends to improve cognition as well. Um, and we've seen that the, the level to which uh, SV2A is expressed in peritumoral regions. So we're using the same setup that uh, Yolanda uh, used for the Neuroligin 3 investigation. We took the, the tissue from the brain surgery, we stained it for left rest, um, for uh, SV2A, sorry. Uh, and then related to that to uh, MEG uh, properties. And we saw that there was again a correlation uh, and that it related to the amount of epilepsy they had, the patients. Um, the key here, of course, that you have one measurement, especially at the micro scale. So what I would love to do is look at this in the patients that have implanted electrodes, um, both microelectrodes and normal electrodes, because they um, usually they um, the uh, drugs are tapered down, the antiepileptic drugs, because the reason that they are implanted with these electrodes is to measure uh, seizures. Um, so if they don't have them, they will taper down the, the the drugs and then see where the seizures come from. And that is, I think, an interventionist model in which you can look specifically at how the taking away at least of this 
uh, synaptic modulation impacts local and thereby global properties. Yeah. But it would still be difficult, obviously, because <laughs> the timing, well, yeah. Yeah, I had a, thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I had another question too, which is a bit off topic, also about metastatic. Metastatic, and yeah. It behaves similarly. So, and, and a, more, a, a bit more fundamental aspect is, does it depend on the kind of cell, mm -hmm. which kind of, um, well, for instance, the uh, tissues surrounding uh, the tumor will behave? Yeah. It does. So that's also what I tried to implicate with this difference between the codeleted gliomas and the non-codeleted because they show completely different profiles in terms of activity. So the, the local hyperexcitability was, was very different in those patients um, but the, or, and the lunar ligand, uh, but the network properties are the same. And the network properties are even the same. For, so we, we don't have data in um, metastatic cancer looking at these network properties, but we did look at meningioma, which is not a primary brain tumor. It's actually a tumor that grows from the meninges. So it's in the skull, it presses on the brain, but it's not in the brain at all. And we see the same type of network problems that we see in the globe, uh, as in the glioma patients. The difference is that we don't see the same activity differences. So that's also the scale thing where I think um, we should zoom in a little bit more. Uh, because this does impact, of course, the way the, the disease impacts the brain um, in different ways. So I think the networks are the most, are the closest to behavior and are thus also the, the, the least um, distinctive between different tumor types, at least. But also in, in general brain disease, right? Because I showed that MS has the same type of network disturbances, temporal lobe epilepsy. The network is, is pretty... A specific. Yeah, thanks. Daniel, I also see you you uh, posted your own papers, of course. Yes, well, it's very. Yeah, I thought it was really highly relevant because it actually, I argue exactly for the claims that you make uh, based on your empirical research. That Great. global yeah. topological properties, so global, um, yeah, properties can influence local properties. Yeah. I use other examples as well. So, uh, any other question or comment for Linda? Well, go pursuing a little bit on, on your last point. Um, could it also be then that the network properties uh, relate to other aspects of the clinical manifestation of disease than the uh, cellular properties of the kind of tumor? Do they have, a, a div, is there a different manifestation? Um, and what do you mean by manifestation? Well, um, so, so, I, so the, 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 the background of the question is that we suppose always that there is a, a relationship between symptoms and causal mechanisms at some underlying level. Mm -hmm. And now you say, the global network properties are um, um, uh, similar in uh, many different uh, forms of uh, brain cancer. So, um, but then the, my question would be, do they also relate to different aspects of the disease? So uh, a simple example would be, do the network problems relate to to, for instance, the mental aspects of having a brain tumor, or mm -hmm. I'm not really thinking that this would be the case, but to make to make the general point clear. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I think that's the case in, indeed. So, for instance, fatigue is a, is of course a um, a symptom that occurs across different brain diseases and psychi psychiatric disorders, right? Um, and we see that the correlates, the network correlates of fatigue, tend to be the same for different. Um, distinct, what we think of as distinct neurological psychiatric problems. Um, so yes, I think that the, the manifestation of brain networks, uh, especially if you look at the more global aspects of brain networks, um, they are more related to the symptoms than to the actual pathology of the disease, 
Is that an answer to your question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think so. The one thing I would say is unexplored, at least to my knowledge, is then how, um, and that comes back to also Daniel's work, I guess, is that if the network topology is at some point such that there is um, a general symptom, how then does that impact the pathology? Because in brain tumors, there's this direct link, as you, as you saw. We know that if there's high, um, that, that um, or we think in simulations, region of the brain um, networks that are more active or that are differently wired in terms of how they dynamically communicate, also that has an impact on how local nodes sort of activate. And this could, of course, impact the pathology itself. Hmm. So that kind of gets at the, the way in which the different skills impact each other. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Very interesting. Thanks, yeah. Gert. Yeah. So, so the location of the tumor doesn't matter anymore, or does it still matter somewhat? It does. It, of course, it matters. Yeah. Uh, and I think the, the anatomical... Uh, location does also matter to some extent um, because of the plasticity and that's why I also I think that glioma is a very interesting disease to study because at the moment that the patient comes in it's already um, I don't have it in these slides but they've done studies in which they try to fi find Broca's area in brain tumor patients and it's all over the place because um, because of the shifting that already happens before even the tumor is noticed. Um, so yes, anatomical location matters. Apparently, network location also matters a lot. Um, and the tumor, like the, the the tumor biology people are all looking at micro um, micro environment, uh, that kind of stuff. So also the 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 at the mac micro scale, the, the location matters. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Um, any other questions or comments for Linda? We still have some time. Hope you do too, Linda. Sure. Yeah. Um, but if not, um, uh, even the discussion is being recorded. And uh, we will post this on YouTube very, uh, very quickly. And as I said, you can get in touch with Linda uh, with further questions or uh, uh, comments uh, through the lecture series website where you have all information uh, about Linda's personal website and, and her work. But if there are no further questions, let's all thank Linda again. Um, and um, we'll continue the series in March as well. I think our next speaker will be Tom Polger of the University of Cincinnati. And we will uh, 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 advertise the talk through the usual channels. So with that, I wish you a happy afternoon. Ciao, ciao. Thanks.